I want to welcome you to the Pro Mindset Podcast. The Pro Mindset Podcast is all about diving into the headspace that results in championship performance. High performing athletes, winners, have this mental flow and have a positive headspace for their performances and success. Join me, Craig Doman, sports attorney and NFL agent, on this podcast. I will interview pro athletes, college athletes, football coaches, and sports personalities. Together, we can discover how you can get in the flow and have your own pro mindset. I want to welcome on Pro Mindset today, Anthony Trucks. Anthony, welcome to the show today. Thank you for having me. Happy to be here. Anthony is a repeat guest. Anthony is a former client, former NFL player, three-time, I believe, Ninja Warrior participant. Three-time? Three-time. How many times you win? Um, none. Anthony! <laughs> hey, I am the first former NFL athlete to hit a buzzer, and only. No one's even, no former NFL guys got past two obstacles. Okay, so that's Anthony's way of saying he's kind of good, but kinda he's good. not hes not a champion yet. Yeah, I'm retired though at that too. <laughs> My elbows aren't built for that. <laughs> okay, so today we, I think what we're going to touch on is something that every single listener is dealing with, which is a pandemic. If you're a parent, you might have your kids at home. Maybe mm-hmm. they've been taking a, a break from school. If you've got college-age kids, they might be back at home. Mm-hmm. Um, if you've got young kids, you've had to figure out daycare. Everybody's in a little bit different situation. Mm-hmm. A lot of people that have been working in offices are, are now working from home, working remotely. So here's, a, here's the big question. Anthony, how do you see people being successful, being fulfilled, and being effective in a new world that we really don't know what it's going to look like after this pandemic is over Mm -hmm. and as we move and progress to a position where we're moving out of the pandemic. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a, (laughs) it's it's funny because that's going to be a a wide open question. I think the first piece of it is letting go and embracing the new. I think a lot of people have fear and anxiety because there's this unknown that I don't know, right? And that's the embrace of the news. People are not embracing new just yet. They're still latched on to what I know. There's that statement, which is, uh, the evil I know is better than the evil I don't. And so a lot of people are attached to this. This is the way the world was working before. I want to go back to this, you know, this whole, you know, this is the old thing. And so I realize that the people I work with and interact with that are the ones that are most stressful are the ones that have not yet detached from that's what the world used to be, and we're going to something new. And the people that are in a, a more positive space, they've embraced that newness uh, is where the, the greatest things in life come. New kids, new jobs, new house, new everything. That's where the great stuff is. And the problem is there's a lot of unknowns in this newness right now. So for a lot of people, I think the stress and anxiety they're running into is they're still attached to the old, have not yet embraced the new. And what that new is I don't know. That's kind of a fun thing. It's, it's going to affect, like you said, parenting, careers, uh, what success looks like, opportunities. Some people's jobs are never going to come back. Um, you know, financial world's going to be uh, all askew. Like, we don't know. But as things come to pass, as the world starts becoming this, this new settled foundation, which could take years, who knows? The people who will have the most success are the ones who are open to the most newness, embracing things that they're completely unaware of, um, feel awkward in. But I think right now it's good. It's like we're all on the level playing ground. You're not doing it by yourself with a world that's already stable. Like this is a completely unsettled world. And because of that, there's almost for me a joy because like I adapt well. And so in understanding how to look at the uh, the future, I think if you can get, get your mind to a position of like, okay, all great things come from the new things are at first unknown. It is scary, but like in that cave of unknown that has like a monster that scares you, it's also a treasure. If you keep holding on to that, I don't know, whatever that, that old world is, you're going to be in chain to something that's going to end up just, you know, the rest of the world passing you by and you're stuck in the background. So what comes to my mind is that everybody and every human gravitates towards their comfort zone. They want to stay in their comfort zone. Mm-hmm. They get to the edge of their comfort zone and they pull back. Yeah. Everybody, not everybody, but most people feel more comfortable being miserable in a comfortable comfort zone mm-hmm. than they do perhaps in seeing happiness or success in something they're uncomfortable with. Yeah. Okay. So give us like your David Letterman top 10 guidelines for life to posit the four piece mm-hmm. positively posture post pandemic. 
positively posture post-pandemic. That's good. Well done. You made that up just now? Just now. <laughs> I like it. Uh, a couple here. So the world that I work in is identity. And, uh, and here's the interesting thing about what you're talking about. Essentially, the posture is to prepare, right? Is to like get ready for. And the, the interesting thing is a lot of people are attached personally to this old world. You know, that job I had when I lost it, I lost me. You know, when I, uh, you know, my kids are home or my wife's home, we're fighting, I lost the relationship, I lost me. And so I'm looking at a lot of people have an identity crisis, more than they even know. It's not just this thing you lost. A lot of people, if you look at kind of like how, like a metaphor, like there's a tree that has fruit. And the fruit's the career, the relationship, the job, all the stuff you have. But when it's stripped from you, you feel like this fruit gets pulled off the tree and it withers and dies. And you think you're the fruit. Like, because it's who I am, right? I'm this job, I'm this money, I'm this relationship. But the reality is, is you're the tree. The tree that you are created the fruit. And so for a lot of people to positively posture, I think the perspective they should proceed with, throwing peas in there for you, <laughs> is to realize like I am the tree and some of my fruit has fallen off the tree and died, but I can produce better fruit. So what I do is first off, I have to go back and I have to look at where do I need to give nutrient to my roots? Like for a lot of people, it's going to be going back and, and looking at their life and saying, where can I be better as a human? It's this thing about personal growth. And a lot of people think it's like, oh, it's just woo woo. And it's just people talking about being better. But like, no, realistically, it's how you act. How do you react? What habits do you have? How do you think? What are your thoughts? Um, what are your personal beliefs about what's possible? When you have these things at the core, like that's, that's actually going in and giving nutrients to the roots. You know, the newts, you know, the, the roots get kind of, you know, more nutrients that a tree can produce good fruit. But the actual, if you look at trees, trees that uh, that don't get pruned properly can't grow proper fruit. So it's also pruning things. So maybe getting rid of certain friends, getting rid of certain environments you used to go to, getting rid of certain beliefs you might have that allow that fruit to grow. So there's uh, this concept that I, I call roots and fruits, which is we just randomly got here, but it's actually something that you listeners can do. And this metaphor is actually a, a, doc, a, doc, a diagram I use with people. So we start out by saying uh, every tree has roots. And if the roots are deep, they can handle the storms of life. Just like a tree in an actual storm that has good roots, the, the tree can't get blown off. And then what happens is those roots, the deeper they are, they can actually get more nutrients, produce great fruit. So the roots you have are five, faith, family, health, friends, and emotions. Faith in a sense of, do you have a faith of God or a higher power, a faith of self, right? Uh, and you number all these just, you know, from zero to 10, 10 being deep root, zero being no death. Then you have family. Where's your family base? Do you have a good core um, that gives you stability back at home to where when you go out in the world, you know, you can come home to that solid base that makes you feel good. Friends, the family you choose. You have people outside of your world. It could be colleagues, it could be individuals that you, you lean on when you need some help. Are they there? Uh, they did a pretty much support and help. Then you have your health, which is uh, this concept, which I really is really basic. When you have your health, you have a million dreams. When you don't, you have one to be healthy. And so the idea is, are people taking care of their bodies, taking care of their mental health? Like you taking care of your physical health so you can go out into the world and do things. And this is, you know, this is eating healthy. This is exercise. This is um, having conversation with people. This is therapy. This is, you know, getting people to, to kind of get in behind the scenes of what's going on in your life. And then the biggest one is emotional control. When you don't have emotional control, you are a leaf in the wind. And so unfortunately, a lot of people, somebody will say something and that person now has control of you. Like you give them the keys to drive you crazy because you can't control your emotions. So they say something, you get angry, you fire back. And when our emotion is high, our intelligence is low. So we typically make poor decisions. Like we'll say the things that we shouldn't say or we'll buy the things we shouldn't buy because we're too happy. <laughs> and then we come home, we're like, why did I buy this bacon maker? I've done this. Personally made a bacon. I bought a bacon maker. It works pretty good. My wife thinks it's a joke, but I like it. But that's the emotional base, right? So those are the roots. If I can be in a good emotional control space, I can master the moments in my life that move mountains, the ones you can't take back. Because a lot of us do things in these moments and we look back like, oh, I wish we would have done X or Y or Z. And sometimes we're too spun up from the situations of life to make clear decisions. When these five roots are deep, it gives you control of self to create in life, which is where you start getting great fruits. So you have five branches for the most part in your life. I think that I've dialed them. I can't find more branches. I probably could, but the five solid ones that are your fruits of life. It's going to be your career. Are you doing a job you love, right? People that support you in your career. Like I know people who try to do like me. I do off the wall things in comparison to my friends. 
but I have a base and a root of friendships, family, and emotional control so I can do a career that I love, right? And it allows me to produce great fruit. Finances. If I have the ability to have a great job or do the things I do, I can make money. But if I have, you know, shady friends who steal from me or take me to a place I shouldn't, I end up in jail, or um, I, I make bad decisions in emotional moments and I lose my money and I gamble it away, right? I can't maintain finances. Then I have the base of education, which is a whole other branch. But am I learning from life? Not just books, not just college courses, uh, but everyday life. I have a practice where every day I extract moments from the day that I'd learn from and make notes on so I can create stuff for the world, for the videos that I do. But a lot of people aren't realizing some of the best lessons are living inside of you every single day. So are you educating yourself on your life? Because you can have age, but still not have wisdom. So are you learning from life? Um, then it's a matter of escape. Are you getting out and seeing this big, beautiful, crazy world we have? Because you've never had a time in life, Craig, like now, where you can actually go see the world. Besides Corona, like it's all locked down. But like in the history of man, I mean, you can get on a flight and travel across the world and still be connected. I mean, it's never been like this in the history of, of society. And so with that, like go escape and, and experience this world you're working to see in your cell phone in real life. And the last piece of it is called LIFT. It stands for Life Inside for Triumph. It's not to try, but to actually triumph. What gives you that fire, like that raises a hot air balloon? Essentially, what's your purpose? And are you living in your purpose every day? And do you feel like you're fulfilled so much so that you're giving back to the world in a positive way? Because if you think about it, fruit isn't just for the tree to consume and to benefit from. The fruit's for the people around to experience and to embrace and to enjoy. So in your life, if you have great fruits, the people around you get to enjoy them as well. So if you have a good purpose and everything's dialed in, your roots and fruits, tree of life, it's all blossoming and well. You live a good life, man. So those are my 10 uh, four Ps you had. I can't remember what they are. Positively posture for the pandemic, post-pandemic. That's what it is. So you've got the roots and fruits. Roots and fruits. And then you did a, you said that there's an inverse relationship between emotional control and? There's no inverse. It's just, so emotional control is just it. But the, the part with emotional control is you can have emotional high and emotional low. And so either either side of those things, if you make decisions in moments that you can't take back that are that are completely emotional driven, you usually in hindsight was the wrong decision. So it's, it lacks wisdom. Yeah, it lacks wisdom. You can call it that for sure because you're not playing in that space. So I guess opposite of emotion is logic because we all I mean, as human beings, it's like some people, they just they seem stoic and they just, you know, they're just emotionless, but they make oddly good decisions. Then some people who are super emotional just do things and are always like a leaf in the wind blowing around. And the problem is I think either side of that's difficult because one side's very rigid, one side's too loose. It's kind of like um, Ford's theory of like the ego, id, super ego, and ego. Like the id is the basal desire. I'm just gonna, I feel like doing it, I do it, like animals. Super ego is like rigid structure, regiment. This is what I do. I don't, I don't budge. The in-between is where your ego sits. You want to do that thing. Super ego says, don't do that thing. Ego says, all right, let's just do this kind of the in-between. So emotion and, and that logic in-between is kind of where people should operate. It's like, okay, I have this emotion. I recognize it. I realize it's there. And right now in this pandemic, people are very emotional. It's trickling into a lot of spaces, relationship-wise, health-wise, self-image-wise, self-respect, um, you know, confidence. And so because they're emotionally driven, uh, they're making poor choices. Some people are doing too much of something, not enough of something, tucking themselves away. They're, they're gaining weight. They're getting stressed out. They're damaging relationships. They're just, they're doing all the wrong things because they're acting emotionally. And the problem is, here's the kicker. When I get to the point of logic and I have to look back at what the emotional person did, sometimes I get unsettled. I feel unhappy. I don't like what that person did. So I don't address it. And I go back to a negative emotional space. I don't like me so much. Like that guy did this, said this, and I go back like, oh man, should I have done that? Oh, and I have to do one of two things. Accept that it wasn't right, sucked, and do something about it, which most people don't like doing. Or try to find a way to condone the actions, get emotional again, I'm back in that same space. So it's hard to get down into a logical space with people because they have to do some introspective work that people don't like doing most of the time. Okay, so I'm going to stick with your analogy of fruits and roots. What happens when there's a freeze? Mm -hmm. This doesn't happen in California, but it happens in the Midwest. Mm -hmm. What is that analogous to in life? Uh, rock bottom, man. I mean, I've been at rock bottoms. I mean, I've wanted to take my life at times. Like it's, it's interesting. And, and what happens is 
it's difficult. It's worse for people who have had a high climb because there's this kind of like this deceptive feel of like, well, I, I had this big tree and it was great and I lost everything. Like I've lost my marriage, my family, my businesses, my health. Like it's just, I've lost stuff all the pivotal time and it sucks. And this is a major crisis for people. People are probably going through this right now. Like this, it's frozen. I don't have anything. All of me that makes me me, this whole tree is gone. But the truth is there's always seeds. And the deceptive thing is I want to go across town, plant this seed, and I want that big tree again right now. And if you take it a step back, there was a person who took that tree, planted the seed, and, and was there to nurture and, and tend to this tree so it could grow as big and healthy as it is. And in those moments, we have to go back to being that person. Because a tree is there living, but somebody had to tend to that tree. Somebody had to plant it, go through the seasons of ups and downs, and it's cold and cover it up and water it and you know, you know, prune the leaves and put the little sticks to guide it to this, you know, to go straight when it's flims, like you have to do certain things. And so if somebody right now has hit the rock bottom, the problem is they are in the worst emotional space to go and start tending to a tree. I don't want to do it. Like it's like I don't feel like doing it. Problem is, is that's the moment you have to. And if you can get out of the space and realize like there is a space, like it's the Midwest, doesn't get as cold as California. I must go find a new environment to plant the seed and get back to work and growing the tree. It's hard because it means you sometimes have to move, you move to a different city, you know, move to a different environment, um, you know, leave certain areas. Like you have to cut short all the things that make you you right now. And that's a difficult thing. Like it's, it's incredibly hard to have to go from scratch. But the truth is either... You're going to do that and create something great, or you will stay a dead, frozen tree, or you will actually die. How do you help people that might be in rock bottom right now, may have lost their job? Mm -hmm. uh, unemployment doesn't even come close to replacing their income. No. How does a man best recover when he's down and out? Yeah. So this is, this is actually the, the process that I work people through. And this may be a little heady, but I hope it's not because it, it doesn't need to be. But I, I break my work down to three simple stages to work through that exact same thing. And, uh, and it's three stages called C, shift, sustain. It's called the shift method. And, and I work on what's called identity shift, to shift into the person you're talking about from the person we currently are. Who's a person that has the job, has the money, has this thing I'm, I want, right? Because if you were that person, you'd already have it. You just, you'd already be doing things that have it. So how do we get there? And people can convolute it, make it all confusing. But the realistic part is you have to first see, then shift, then you got to sustain the progress. So the shift thing is unique because a lot of people, they, they know how to work. Men know how to work. Like you, you put me somewhere, I'll figure a way to work. I'll just do things. I'll get to the back end of it. Be totally exhausted. You have nothing to show for it. And it's usually because we just know how to work. What we don't do well is go back to the first phase, which is see and see what work we should be doing. We'll do the work we might know, but that work we did got us here. And we'll do the work that feels comfortable. The stuff that like, I could do this and I can, you know, sleep with myself and I'll get by. But we're not trying to get by anymore. We're trying to climb and thrive at certain levels, right? Mm -hmm. So for me, it's, I must go back and look at a few things. And I got a client today I was just going through this exact process with. But it's, I need you to see a couple of things. One, I need you to see why you are where you are and pull the ego back. Men, we have the biggest egos who we are it's our it's our pride everything we've done it's like who we are and so when you attack that like you're attacking us and it's a problem and so in order for us to actually get better we have to give ourselves permission to improve and you're never going to give yourself permission to improve if you won't accept the things that need to be improved maybe it's how you communicate maybe it's how you drop your pride and do that job that you didn't see yourself ever doing but your family needs you to pay bills um, maybe it's having a hard conversation with your spouse you know and, and letting her really tell you what needs to be said so you sit back and like eat that and like, all right, I do got to be a better husband or a better dad or a better coworker. But until you will like swallow that pride pill and legitimately look at what needs to be done, you're never going to do the right work. My pastor called it uh, the shift work for a lot of people. It's like climbing a ladder, huffing and puffing, lean against a building, get to the top, dead tired. And then I look and realize the ladder's leaning against the wrong building. I was just doing the work, right? Where I should have been leaning against that building. And so the C phase is going back and seeing really, why am I stuck? But then the beautiful part is also seeing, where can I go? It's not just seeing the bad stuff, but it's also seeing the good stuff, which is like, all right, this door closed. What other opportunities lie ahead? What, you know, what treasure lies in a cave I, I haven't been looking for? 
so I can actually see these new opportunities. So if somebody is sitting like, what do I do? Start asking questions of people like, what would you do? Like ask people that are your, you know, your nieces, nephews, grandkids, cousins, brothers, ask people who maybe you made fun of their career, but they seem to be comfortable right now. What do I got to do to do your job, right? Go and drop the pride and start looking at nuances that could be part of your future. Because at this point, I mean, it's an unsettled, open world. You can do anything with technology connections and maybe you have to learn some things you didn't know before. Like, don't be lazy. Go figure these nuances out. And then you start doing the right shift work. Once you're doing that work, one thing people have really got to realize is it's going to be this process that incredibly sucks. Like you are not going to like almost any stage of this because you have to do things you didn't do, get judged for things you'd ever you know, been judged for. But the reality is, is just like you built your life to now, it's a statement that I, I live by in my work and it's what you create creates you. So it's the process of creation that creates the sense of pride and self and confidence. So when I know what work I'm supposed to do now, and I start going to the shift phase and doing the work, the more that I go through and experience the pain of sucking at this, the more I learn. And then I go and try it again and it gets less painful and it gets less painful. If it's like, let's say zero to 10 of pain and you know 10 was the first time, well, the second time it's nine. Second, third time it's going to be eight, you know, and it gets lower. And what most people think is it goes from that 10 to zero and like, okay, I do it without pain, but I kind of hate it. It's not, it goes to a joy. Because I know how hard it was. And this is now who I am to do this. And I find peace and joy in doing this thing that was difficult. But it always starts with being ridiculously painful. And nobody likes the work. But to those who stay in it long enough, that get the benefit of, on the back end, the things that used to be incredibly difficult for you are super easy. And they move the needle. You make progress. And the last stage of it is simple. It's, it's what are you doing to sustain this? Because some people will start driving down roads like this in life and they go, you know, go down a good distance. And, but they, they get to the point of like they were addicted to that struggle like you talked about. They just they know this pain. And so what happens is they'll make U-turns and they don't sustain the progress. And they slide back downhill and they start back at square one again. And then because they're back at square one, they feel even worse about themselves because they're back at square one. So to sustain, big thing is make sure you are continuously checking in. Is, does your heart love this? Are you, are you driving in a direction that you know is going to be something you want? Because if you don't have your heart in it, you're never going to have anything. Um, also make sure that you're going the right direction. Like, am I still headed where I'm supposed to go? Hive is a big piece. Surround yourself like a bee, you know, has hive and then make sweet honey. Like your life is honey. You got to have a hive where your, your friends, colleagues, this, this roots we talked about, like, where is that in your life? Do you have the people around you? that make your life great, that give you the support you need. And sometimes you got to get rid of some of the people in the hive and you got to add people to it. And adding people is scary too, man. Sometimes people don't realize like going out, like you can cut friends off, it's scary, but going out and talking to somebody who's levels above you that you don't like, you feel like I'm not, I don't belong in their circle and I'm less than them. Like that's a scary place to go also, but you got to go do it. You'd be surprised because so many people think that same way. So few people pursue higher level humans. And you'd be surprised, like you're just like me, like when people reach out to you, you want to help them. So find people that are outside your comfort zone that you know you want to be similar to or have similar success and go approach them. And the last part of it is when you've done this, you'll thrive. Call it drive, hive, and thrive. And thrive is a big thing because I find that when I'm thriving and the people I know they're doing great in the world, they're doing well, they want to give back. And when you're in a place to give back, you get to reach that that kind of pinnacle uh it's kind of a concept of like marginal utility. You ever heard of that? Or like, you know, the, the first one's great. The first hamburger's good. You know, the second one, ah, third hamburger, I don't know. But if I got 10 hamburgers, the only way I'm going to feel good again, and I've already full, is to give hamburgers to people who are hungry. That's my thrive. Like, how do I give my success to other people and get that same feeling I had when I was succeeding? Or, or try steak. Or try steak. That works too. <laughs> <laughs> this methodology of sorts with the C shift and sustain that's an awesome way to make a change if you don't like where you're at and you need to make a change you know you want to you want to have a better job you want to have a better life you want to live in a different neighborhood you want to live in a different state you want to have better friends first of all change your identity because if you don't modify your identity you'll gravitate back to where you are right now unconsciously you'll do it status quo and this is a methodology for making a permanent change, mm -hmm. not just a temporary one. Yeah. And then change and as change comes, shift with shifting times. What do you see as the most typical issue 
men have? Ego and pride. Big time. How does that hurt them the most? I think the reason it hurts a lot, and I had this, I'm saying it from my own personal perspective and my clients, because I got clients that are executives at, you know, literally the top company in the world. And it's interesting, they've achieved a lot, right? But when you tell somebody that they need to be better, nobody likes to hear they have to be better. Because they think that assumes there's something wrong with you. It's not the case. It's, it's just, it's you're great, but there's a level of greater. There's a level of happy above what you're at. So for most people, they attach um, this, I've done this, therefore I am great. And you, we need that, right? So ego and pride, in fact, is a positive thing. It's when I was playing professional football, you know, it's like thing that, that the ego and the pride of like, I'm a professional football player is why I show up to practice on time and I eat my food and I lift the way I lift because I want it. Like, that's who I am. Those actions protect the identity. The problem is those same actions will protect the identity from things it needs to grow. And, and so the ego and pride usually steps in and it shuts down all the people who tell you ways you can be better and you can improve or tells you ways not to lose what you've already got. Because a lot of guys, their, their ego and pride will pop in and it'll take, it'll dismantle their life without them even realizing it until it's too late. And so for a lot of people, it's that pride of, this is who I am. This is what I've done. Who are you to tell me any different? I'm great. I'm amazing. And that's cool. That's great but to you. But the reality is the rest of the world around you, they're not seeing that. And so if you're the only one that sees that, you might want to take a look differently. And that's what I think stops a lot of people from giving, like I said, or they're giving themselves permission to improve in some way. Well, the word picture that popped in my mind is that a lot of guys that are great, a lot of guys that have been, a lot of people that have been successful, they climbed a mountain. Mm -hmm. However, when they got to the top of the mountain, they didn't climb the next highest mountain. They settled for the mountain top they're at. Mm -hmm. And that's where they need ego and pride to protect their status as that mountaintop dweller. But it, prevents them, their ego and pride prevents them from going to a higher altitude mm -hmm. because they got to keep climbing. Mm -hmm. I see this a lot with players. Everybody wants to work hard, but they want a finish line. Yeah. The only finish line is six foot under. You don't get to hit the finish line. And when you do hit the finish line, that's when you go from a growth mindset to a stagnant one. Fixed. Yeah, they call it fixed, fixed, right? If you climb a mountain, you can't even push pause. You got to just keep going to the next one. Mm -hmm. If you think about climbing a mountain, it's all, it's all great. You climb the mountain, it's very hard, arduous. We climbed Pikes Peak a few years ago. Yep. And you get to the top and it's like, all right, it's, it's just short-lived at the top. Right? You get there, you spend more time on the mountain, more time on the mountain climbing it than you do at the top. And so when people ask, like, how do I, how do, I do what I do and stay consistent and build, it's like, I've got to the point where what you talked about is a lot of guys have got to the peak and they're hanging out at the peak and they fell in love with the peak, but it kind of is lonely up there and it sucks and it's the only place you can go. And so they won't go to the next one because they didn't love the journey. They didn't fall in love with the climbing the mountain. They want to stay where they feel comfortable. And for me, I, like, I am addicted and I love the journey of my life. I love the long days. I, I love the, the hard parts. I love the problems. I love the solutions. I love the success. Like I love those little pieces. But I, I am so in joy with my daily life and how it is that the peaks come and go. I get to the peak. I enjoy it. Let me get back on a mountain I want to climb. And most people's pride and ego won't let them get to a space of continuous work. Like when I came out of the league, uh, one of the things that I was okay with was going back and training nine-year-olds in my gym and building up again. Whereas a lot of my teammates came back, they'd make fun of me. I had guys that were like, we well, didn't work with nine-year-olds. used to play in the league. And like those guys would go broke. Because they couldn't work for anybody. They were too good to work. And I realized, like, for me, it's like, no, I'm fine. And I just, I loved my process, loved my journey. I've built, and some of those guys have not come to me and said, how are you doing what you're doing? Like, wanting questions answered. And, you know, how do you get to that level? How do I do this? And it's like, man, you got to work. They still don't want to work, though. Like, there's still this addiction to, like, I got to my peak. I'm going to climb again. Like, no, but if you fall in love with the journey and the process, you'll just get used to rolling. You'll cover more peaks than you ever imagined simply because you got used to dropping the pride and ego and just working more than anybody else would. Let's talk about the journey. Yeah. One of the things that I think that drives guys is being passionate for what you do mm -hmm. and having a motivation and a why that helps you stay on your journey. Mm -hmm. I think about it where if you think about taking a trip somewhere, 
and I leave the house. I'm going to go to some beautiful, say, beautiful place in like, I don't know, Italy on the beach somewhere in the amazing hotel that overlooks the entire ocean. If I leave my house in, say, California, and I'm, you know, I get to my, you know, my car's late, so I get to my flight late, it's delayed, and I got to get another flight and transfer over, they lose my bag when I get there, the flight attendant was horrible, I land, the taxi driver when I get to Italy is, you know, lost, and I get to the room, and my room's not ready, and, and the event is ready, you're not going to walk into that room with all that negative, bad energy, and be like, oh, I'm here, happy now, just not switch it on, you're just in a good room, unhappy, your destination, unhappy, but... If you were grateful with all those things happening, like, you know what? At least I get a car ride to get to the airport. I have money to buy a flight. The flight attendant, you know what? I don't have her job. And I see this guy over here complaining. So it wasn't the greatest. Taxi driver, he used to live in Italy. I need to visit the place, you know? If room wasn't ready, that's okay. I could spend some time at the bar going and walking around and enjoying this beautiful place I'm at. Then you get to the room, it's icing on the cake. It's beautiful. And I want to take more trips. So more people need to start finding a way to be grateful and enjoying the journey, even if perspectively you think it sucks. There's always levels within it that are great if you choose to see them. And then when you get to your destination, it's incredible. But if you hate the journey, even the destination will suck. Well said. Well, you talked about, and you mentioned before, levels of greatness. Mm -hmm. How does someone that is really, really doing well even do better? Even though maybe their friend group, high school buddies college buddies, family, like, man, you've made it. Mm -hmm. You're good. Yeah. You don't need to work that much. You don't need to try that new career. How do you go to higher levels, levels of greatness when a lot of you people that helped you get to the level you're at now think you should put it on cruise control? Yeah, hang out. This is kind of my life, man. I, I, my wife and I both, we are the only college graduates in our family. Uh, we make good income. We do a lot of travel. Like we, we are those people. And, and a lot of people are like, why do you want more? What do you go after more for? And I think the interesting thing is when they ask that, they see my success as a diminishing of their level of life. And it never is. It's never that perspective. And then because I feel like that, or they may say that, it actually stunts my growth sometimes, I've, I've found. Like in the past, like I, I didn't want to go around my friends and talk about this new contract I got that made great income because I didn't want to make my friends feel bad. And it sucks because then... Who do you celebrate with? And then you got to find new friends. But I don't want new friends. Like, I love my friends. And I want to and then I want to have new friends and then lose these friends and make it be like, well, you guys didn't make enough money. And so I guess success is, first of all, uh, I have to accept the fact that me having success doesn't belittle anybody. It doesn't make you better than them. It doesn't make them less than you. It's just you're doing something for you, right, first. Secondly, uh, I believe we have to get to this point where we set our own scale, not the world scale. Because the world scale is very, it's its unsettled, it's unstable, it doesn't exist. There's, there's, I mean, Jeff Bezos is the richest man on earth. He still wants money, right? So I could be infinitely unhappy if I don't find a level of what makes me happy, my own personal scale. And so I find that there's been a lot of years where I, I would accomplish things. And I would talk to some people and some people would be like, why would you even do that? You already had X. And some people would say, you, but you got that done, but you didn't get this. And they, no matter which way you go, you feel unhappy. And I was like, man, I don't like this. This is the feeling I have from people giving me their insight. So I went back and said, what's great for me and my family? You know, what, what kind of lifestyle for me is good? Like in the world of what I do, a lot of guys have to be road warriors, get on stages, speak, pound their chest, be the guy. And I could do that. But in my world, I choose not to. Like I'm in season of dad, I call it. I like being home with my kids. I like taking them to school. I like being able to pick them up. I like being in practice. I like being, I love that. And if I was to go and chase the fame or the money and do the thing that the world said Anthony should do, I'd miss out on all those things. And so to not feel bad when that goes on, I just set my own scale and I go after what I feel is great. I want to create generational wealth for my kids. I want them to understand the value of money, but I don't want them to have to work so incredibly hard to get it like I did. It's just the reality of it. I want them to have those intangibles, but I don't want it to be this like almost a coin flip for them. And my friends, some get it, some don't get it. I just don't care. Like, my wife gets it. And that's who it matters. At the end of the day, my wife gets it, I get her. And that's really all that matters in my home. And so if, if the people that I really hold the dearest and closest to me understand it, then I, I fight for what I want to go after. And so people who want more, uh, at, at the end of the day, like, if you want more and there's valid reasons behind it, it's not going to jeopardize what you've already got that makes you happy, go after it. It doesn't matter what the rest of the world says. Patrick Mahomes, biggest contract of any professional athlete in the history of sports. Yeah. 
even though it might have been 12 years total, 10 year extension, mm -hmm. it's over a half a billion dollars. How is it, how do you anticipate the fans, his teammates, his coaches' expectations, mm -hmm. maybe even his drive? How do you see some of those things being affected, positively or negatively? Yeah, you know, here's the thing. I don't know his circle, and his circle is going to be the most important piece because he's going to have people that come from both sides of that. You don't need that kind of money. What makes you think you're worth that kind of money? Teammates, family, friends, people come out of the woodworks want some of his money. It's just the nature of it. So he's going to have to have people he can confide in that won't take advantage of him. At the same time, there's going to be people who, who will, oddly like, They'll, when somebody else outpaces him or something, they'll downplay it. And I think what'll matter is how grounded he is as a human, which will be based on the people who he'll keep around him, who will keep him in, in his mental space. Like Kevin Hart's a good example of this, in a sense, like he accomplished all these things. And he is, I've watched a documentary from him, he's really big on the people he keeps around, being able to keep him in his size. He's a short guy already, but you get it. Mm -hmm. And the idea, I think, is, and I've never been in this position, so I can't even attest what it'll be like, but. I feel like the people that I've seen that are successful have a core group of humans around them that it's impenetrable. I don't listen to the naysayers. I take everything that's positive with a grain of salt, um, but I continue to work. And if his heart is to be a guy that is like not money driven, but wants to have a legacy, I think it'll be great. And I think he's in a position to leave a phenomenal legacy. He's got so much support. He's got, he's likable. I mean, he's got everything he needs. Like he could be one of those guys that it's almost like LeBron's doing now. Like he transcends the game. Like Kobe did, can transcend the game. You don't have a football player that I can think of that's done that, to be honest. For some reason, it's basketball players. There's been some guys that have big names and they're big, you know, highly touted. Um, Kaepernick kind of is, but he's not playing anymore, right? But if a guy like Pat Mahomes can be a guy that people like, um, he's a workhorse, does his thing, doesn't get a big head, like stays, stays dialed in because of people around him hopefully keep him dialed in, I think he can do something that leaves an incredible, like impactful legacy on the world past the game. Okay, let's go back to the post-pandemic. Give me two or three things you would recommend as a life coach, friend, mm -hmm. neighbor, to, to listeners out there to maximize their joy and success coming out of this time whenever mm -hmm. this changes. Yeah. Uh, I would tune your brain to bring in new information. Like tune your brain to start learning again. Big time. I think that's one of the, the determining factors. It'll be a matter of it, whether or not somebody goes, ah, I don't feel like doing that. And they don't do it. And that could be learning technology in a way that nobody thought. I mean, we got more coming on the pipeline between AI and 5G and virtual reality and new platforms. I mean, this, the world's going to continue to expand open. It's just, it's just going to happen. And if you're going to thrive in this next future world that's going to be digitally connected like it is now, you got to be open to things that you were completely shut off to before. And that's going to be difficult for a lot of people. I'm in a position where like I'm in the online world and there's things that I don't want to have to learn, but I'm finding myself. I have to learn these things. So that's the first part of it. Uh, and then I think we're going to get to the point of post information, which we're all in an information age, but there's an information. It's going to be the execution age who does something with this information. A lot of people do what I call as a shelf esteem. They buy the book, they put it on the shelf and they feel good, but they never read the book. Therefore, you can't apply the information and you're no better than the person that can't read. And so it gets to the point where people have to take the information that you're being um, introduced to, sometimes for free a lot of the time in consuming, and start applying it past the pain points to create something. Because that creation process, that's the ugly arduous piece. But I mean, think about like, you know, famous artists and sculptors and, you know, like whoever created Michelangelo's uh, David. Right? Like, that's a sculpture at the time. He created that. Tell me his hands didn't cramp up. It wasn't like tired days. Like, it, it, but the creation of it, when he got done, like, it's probably like if you could see him today, he probably put his chest up and, like, I'm one of the greatest sculptors in the world ever. He didn't get that until he made that. And so, if you go to the point of, like, I'm going to consume and learn things I didn't want to have to learn, and you get insatiably desiring, like, this desire of creating something and staying in the hard parts to get to the process of creation, you'll create an entire new you and then I'll create an entire new life. I want to say thank you so much for being on the show today. Thank you for your wisdom, your perspective. You have practiced what you preach. You have seen, you have shifted, and you have sustained multiple times through lots of adversity, 
and the roots and fruits that you talk about, you've done it. Your life is an example of it because you're not the same guy you were 15 years ago. <laughs> you keep growing. I see you every year mm-hmm. and you keep growing. You're like a man on a mission. You just keep growing. And I don't know too many people that do that, whether they're former professional athletes or not. And so I give you a lot of credit for that. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. Seriously, dude. It means a lot coming from you. I have a great deal of respect for you, man. Thank you for listening to this episode of Pro Mindset. If you enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. You can follow us on our website, promindsetpodcast.com, or on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Pro Mindset Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. We'll see you the next time.